This is Alexanderland. It's a little more than 1,000 square kilometers in size, and it's home to a Russian military base. There's a 2.5 kilometer long airstrip, an advanced radar station, and it's rumored to house the new and possibly unstoppable Kinchal missile. But the strangest thing about this military base is that just a few years ago, it didn't exist, and neither did the numerous other Russian military bases that have recently been built in the Arctic. If you look at these images from 2018 and 2019, you can see huge Russian cargo ships carrying thousands of pounds of construction materials to Alexanderland. Russia is building military bases in the Arctic, and the world has taken notice. See, with these bases, Russia is trying to lay claim to one of the most important areas of ocean in the world, the Arctic Sea. The Arctic Sea is incredibly rich in natural resources, 90 billion barrels of oil, 1600 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 10% of the world's fisheries. Most importantly though, the Arctic is melting, slowly opening up valuable shipping routes that will change the very way our goods get transported. Because these new shipping routes will enable us to shorten the distance from Asia to Europe by 40%. It's an extremely important body of water. And right now, eight countries lay claim to some part of it. Now, most countries base their claim on the UN Law of the Seas, where it says that a country's territorial waters extend 200 miles off their shore, an area called the Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEC. Countries have exclusive rights to all the resources and trade in their EEC. It's their sovereign territory. So for example, any oil that's found within 200 miles of the coast of Norway belongs exclusively to Norway. But any area that isn't in an EEC is regarded as international waters and it falls under UN maritime law, which means everybody shares it. And on a map of the Arctic Circle, the current maritime borders leave an unclaimed triangle-shaped region of international waters that reaches across the North Pole and some of the Arctic Ocean. Essentially, this territory is obtainable to any country that is able to prove that it belongs to them. And proof equals sound geological evidence that a naturally prolonged continental shell extends beyond a country's maritime border and into international waters. Essentially meaning, countries can't just pull a China and pour sand into the ocean to form a temporary continental shelf. Instead, a country making a territorial claim submits its case to a UN committee. Then scientists from the CLCS will assess the validity of that country's claim. Which is great, but in the case of valid claims that overlap other countries' valid claims, it is up to the countries themselves to figure out who it should belong to. And this is where our problems start to arise. See, up until recently, Russia, Denmark and Canada had submitted claims to these species of the Arctic. And as you can see, these claims overlap each other. But this isn't even the full picture, since just a few months ago, Russia decided to extend its claim. So this is what Russia's new claim looks like. It extends all the way to both Canada's and Denmark's EECs, and this means if the UN committee decides that all three claims are valid, well, then there's this huge area of the Arctic that Denmark, Canada and Russia need to split using a method that isn't scientific. And this is where the numerous military stations Russia has been building in the Arctic over the past few years become quite concerning. Now, Putin has made Russia's actions in the north very clear, and if the military actions on their own were concerning, well, then Russia Russia's three key objectives in the Arctic are horrifying. See, Russia not only wants to enhance homeland defense, which to be fair is exactly the same reason every single other country comes up with when they build new bases, they also want to secure Russia's economic future, and seeing as the Arctic is full of valuable resources and will eventually have incredibly important shipping routes running through it, it is a no-brainer. But Russia's last key objective in the Arctic is the one that concerns me the most, and that is creating a staging ground to project power. And I'll be honest, they've been quite successful with that. Russia's Arctic presence now includes no less than 10 air defense radar stations, 13 airfields, 16 deep water ports and more still under construction. Take a look at Sretny Ostrov, which is located in Sevratnia Simlaya. It was an old air base that got abandoned under the Soviet Union, but today it has been resurrected bigger and stronger than it ever was and operates as a landing strip for Russian aerospace bombers. But to understand the full picture of Russia's military presence in the Arctic, let me show you what the other nation's military looks like in this region because there is quite the difference. Now, the country with the most bases besides Russia is the United States, which isn't really that surprising. They have 12 bases in Alaska. But what might surprise you is that they also have a base on Greenland called Tula Air Base, which is actually the United States' northernmost base. 
But when it comes to the remaining countries, well, let's just say Russia's military presence far outweighs the rest, even the United States. While NATO sees Russia's moves as aggressive, Russia sees NATO as the provoker of these actions. Just listen to this. There haven't been so many of their forces here for years. Decades. Not since World War II. This statement was given by a Northern Fleet Commander Admiral Museev. He also said the following. We see such activity as provocative, so close to the Russian border where we have very important assets. By that I mean nuclear forces. So yeah, let's just say this is not child's play. But NATO might actually be onto something here. See, one thing is all the bases Russia has been building. Another is all the money they have poured into the protection and sustenance of what it considers to be its maritime passage, the Northern Sea Route. Stretching over 5,600 kilometers, the NSR has undergone several significant changes. For one, Russia's nuclear agency, Rosatom, has been given the mandate to regulate who passes through the NSR. Foreign warships and various cargo carriers must obtain permission from the Russian government and give a 45-day notification before entering the passageway. Russian pilots must also be accommodated on ships for constant monitoring. This action alone has caused controversy as the international community largely sees the NSR as an international passage while Russia asserts with a heavy military presence that the NSR is their internal waterway. Improved airfields and the deployment of highly sophisticated radar system on Wrangel Island ensures that Russia is aware of anyone operating on what they consider their claimed areas, which on its own is quite worrying. But once you move towards the central Arctic, you start to see the true scope of Russia's efforts. The small islands of Kotelny and Novaya Semlaya house state-of-the-art air defense mechanisms that can, if needed, refuse air, land or maritime access to any opposing nation. Both NATO and the US have rung alarm bells over this aggressive approach to Arctic activity. Canada, Iceland, Finland, Norway and Sweden's foreign ministers have also joined in on the call to restrain extreme military movement in the Arctic. In a recent briefing at the Pentagon, Department of Defense Press Secretary John F. Kirby made the United States' opinions known, saying without getting into specific intelligence assessments, obviously we're monitoring it very closely. And with Russia taking up the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, which governs activity and promotes cooperation in the Arctic, it looks like tensions will only rise. Some of this activity has led members of the European Union amongst other nations to request integration into the Arctic system. Environmental concerns and the current state of global welfare have led some to believe that the fate of such a vital region should not be left to such a select few. The indigenous people of these areas have also lent their voices to the issues, as these movements directly affect their daily lives. Now, Russia's rebuttal to NATO and US sentiments came through Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who expressed that the Arctic is our territory, our land. And one way they've tried to show that, I mean, besides heavily ramping up their military presence in the Arctic, is by sending a submarine to the North Pole and planting a Russian flag on the bottom of the ocean. So yeah, Russia really wants the Arctic, and do we really believe that nations like Denmark, Canada, Sweden, Norway and Finland have the chance to stop them? Well, I guess only time will tell, but so far the submissions made by the Arctic nations regarding the extension of their claims have been in the reviewing process for decades now, and we don't expect them to be resolved anytime soon. So the final victory of the Arctic will remain a mystery, for, for now at least.